Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick recap of some inverse facts that you should know from the chapter 5 in your textbook uh, that we've already done before we do the section 10.6, the inverse trig functions. So what we want to do is we want to take a look at kind of what's going on, what are some properties of inverses that we need to remember. All right, first is that if you have two functions, if the g of f of x equals x, Basically, that means that g and f cancel each other out, that whatever f did to x, g will undo it, okay? Because remember, g of f of x is g of f of x. And in the order that you do things, you put x into the function f, you get the output from f, it becomes the input into g, and g, of course, undoes whatever f did, and that gives us back our x. And the rule with the inverses are that G has to undo F, F has to undo G, and if that is true, then they are inverses, okay? And they're said to be invertible. Um, properties of inverse functions. The range of the function F is the domain of its inverse, and the domain of F is the range of the inverse, because you're switching your inputs and your outputs, domains and ranges switch. If you input A and you get B on the original function, the inverse, you input B and you get A, all having to do with the switching inputs and outputs. Your point AB is on the graph of F, only if you switch X and Y, and BA is on the graph of its inverse. Okay, All good facts to remember about inverse functions. The uniqueness of inverse functions and their graphs. If you know a function is invertible, there is exactly one inverse function for F, when is it invertible? When it is one-to-one, -one. okay? Um, red is F inverse. The graph is the reflection of the graph across the line Y equals X. And so that will come up when we're doing our inverse functions. Um, a function is one-to-one -one if each input goes to exactly one output and each output goes to exactly one input. And if you will recall our little definition, if the outputs were equal, then the inputs must have also been equal. All right, and then we had our horizontal line test, which is we want to see if the function is one-to-one. -one. We do the vertical line test for function, horizontal line test to tell if that function is one-to-one. -one. Okay, so all good stuff to remember. Now, specifically related to this section, I want to go back and talk about x squared. And x squared was not a one-to-one -one function, so as it stood, it was not invertible. However, we did a restriction on the domain. If I kind of ignore the left half of it, I just kind of delete that part out, and I only look at the positive side, so I'm putting a restriction on it, that I'm only going to let x be greater than or equal to zero. I'm going to call these the principal values for this y equals x squared graph. And if I do that, then I can take my new function that I created, this restriction, which is only half the parabola, reflect that over the line y equals x and get an inverse. So y equals square root of x is the inverse for the principal values. In other words, only for y equals x squared for x greater than or equal to zero. So that's kind of what we did back when we were doing the square root graph. And kind of where this comes in, if I am evaluating square root of 9. Now I know that uh, some of you are probably going to chime in at this point and say square root of 9 is plus or minus 3, and I'm going to say you are incorrect. You have to remember that y equals square root of x is the inverse only for the principal values, which I will remind you are only x greater than or equal to 0, which means that if you actually type in square root of 9 into your calculator, it will only give you one answer because this is supposed to be a function. I am putting in 9, and that square root is going to return the principal value, which is the positive number for which 9 is the square of, okay? And that's going to be kind of a key. If I said square root of 4, the answer is 2. Square root of 36, the answer is 6. There will always only be one answer. If I wanted the non-principal value, I would have to use a different square root. I would have to use the negative square root, and that's completely different. So you want to kind of be careful about this, that evaluating using an inverse that is a function 
you should only have one output. And that output would have been the positive input for which 9 is the square of. All right, so now keeping that in mind, we're going to come over here to our trig function. Now, on your trig functions, what you have to notice here as well is that your trig function is obviously not one-to-one. -one. If I were to draw a horizontal line, this clear, clearly is going to fail the horizontal line test. So it is not one-to-one. -one. But we can do the same thing that we did for the y equals x squared graph. I'm going to basically ignore the parts of it that are making it not one-to-one. -one. I am going to create a restriction, and I'm going to call these the principal values for the cosine function. Sorry, principal values. And if I do that, I end up with a section of the graph, which I have highlighted down here, for which it is one-to-one. -one. And notice the key here is that the range of this is including all the ratios and the domain is that restriction that I made which is 0 to pi and what I'm going to do is I'm now going to flip this across the y equals x right which is our how we get our inverse function uh, kind of thinking about key points this point right here on the cosine graph the cosine of 0 is 1 so on this graph is going to become 1 0 now notice that kind of in this idea of switching inputs and outputs, in your cosine function, y equals cosine of x, what you input is an angle, and what you get out is your ratio. But when I'm over here on the inverse cosine, and I'm going to show a little different notation for this, your inverse cosine, right, because I can attach the negative one to the function name, and that means cosine inverse or inverse cosine, this x is not an angle anymore. This is the ratio because I have switched the inputs and the outputs. And this y is the angle that you are going to get back. So that's the first kind of key idea that the inverses switch the inputs and the outputs. So this is now the ratio. This is now the angle. My point that was right here on the cosine function, the cosine of the angle pi over 2 is 0. So over here, because I'm switching them, the ratio 0 goes with an angle of pi over 2. And then the last key point over here is the point the cosine of the angle pi is negative 1. So the ratio negative 1 maps to the angle of pi. Now the kind of important thing about this though is that the only way for us to have had an inverse of the cosine function is we had to do this restriction. We had to create these principal values and only look at part of the graph. And this comes up to the evaluation part of it. The idea here is that this angle, it's not just any angle that is being mapped to it. It's going to be only the angle in the principal values. So it's only an angle from 0 to pi. So the idea here is you're going to have to remember, just like you remember, if I say what is the square root of 9, your answer is 3. Because the square root is the principal one, and it's only going to return the positive value for which 9 is the square. So, and again, when we see this inverse cosine, because we're turning it into this function by doing the restriction, whenever I put in a ratio, and I'm asking for what angle has the cosine ratio, that angle can only be an angle that is the principal one, which has to be between 0 and pi, which kind of as another side comment, this is basically quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. So for example, just to kind of do two little examples here before I look at the inverse sine, if I were, and then again, kind of notation-wise, you see that I have down here arc cosine of x? Arc cosine of x and inverse cosine of x mean exactly the same thing. Uh, the arc cosine on the unit circle, arcs and angles are the same kind of interchangeable words. So this means the arc whose cosine ratio is x, or the angle whose cosine ratio is x. And that's one of the things that you probably want to do when you see an inverse trig function. When I write down this statement, y equals inverse cosine of x, the sentence that you should be reading or thinking in your head is y is the angle... And then you got to go, wait a minute, principal values come into play. 
So the angle on the interval 0 to pi, because those are the principal values, for which the cosine ratio is x. And so that's kind of our idea of how, what you're going to interpret whenever you see an inverse function. So for example, if I say evaluate, which is what we're going to be doing for a lot of these, the inverse cosine of 1 half. What I am basically asking you for here, the sentence means I want you to find an angle, but the angle has to be one of the principal angles. So I need to find an angle between 0 and pi that has a cosine ratio of 1 half. So that is basically what you're being asked to find there. So take a moment, pull out your unit circle, take a look at your unit circle, and find the angle in this section, which again I will remind you is quadrant 1 and quadrant 2, for which you have a cosine ratio of 1 half. So pull your unit circle out. Alright, so on the unit circle, I am looking for the angle between 0 and pi, which is in this section right here, okay, from here to here, that has a cosine ratio of 1 half. Remember, cosine is the x-coordinate, so I scan my points and I see right here is an x value or a cosine ratio, and that happens to be the cosine of pi over 3. So when I come back to the problem that I ask you to do, okay, down here, I want to find the cosine of the angle, or find an angle whose cosine ratio is 1 half. What we know is that the cosine of pi over 3 equals 1 half from the unit circle. I know that pi over 3 is between 0 and pi. So that means it's the principal value. It is the answer that I would actually get on the calculator. It's the only answer that I am asking you for in this. So the inverse cosine of 1 half would be pi over 3. Okay. Let's look at a second example. Let's look at, let's do the inverse cosine of negative square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so I'm asked to find this. So what you're going to do is you're going to think, what does this mean? This means find an angle, and again, it's between 0 and pi, because you've got to think about your principal values, that has a cosine ratio of negative square root of 2 over 2. All right, so again, we're going to go to the unit circle flip over to this page, and on this unit circle, taking a look at it, again, I have to do between 0 and pi, I am looking for an angle that has a cosine ratio of negative square root of 2 over 2. Now, the first thing I have to think of is cosine is the x-coordinate, and the x-coordinate is negative in quadrant 2. So I'm going to be over here in quadrant 2. I find the angle that has a cosine ratio of negative square root of 2, so we know the cosine of 3 pi over 4 is negative square root of 2 over 2. So coming back to my problem that we are doing, okay, down here. Now, so since I know the cosine of 3 pi over 4 equals negative square root of 2 over 2, we know that 3 pi over 4 is between... 0 and pi, and that means it's one of the principal values. So I know that the answer, what this is asking me to return, is going to be the angle 3 pi over 4. Okay? So the idea here is, is that if I'm asking you to evaluate, is you do have to remember that whenever I ask you to evaluate an inverse trig function, it will have to return the principal values. And the principal values for your cosine is going to be 0 to pi quadrant 1 and quadrant 2. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the inverse cosine. Okay. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to basically take the inverse 
of the regular sine graph, we go, hey, it's not one to one. Okay, if I am not one to one, I failed the horizontal line test, then I need to make a restriction in order to make it one to one. And again, that restriction that I'm going to make, I want to make sure I include all the ratios. I want to make it from the min to the max. But in this case, notice my principal values are going to be a little different. I cannot keep 0 to pi, because that only covers, and that section's not 1 to 1, and it only covers the ratios from 0 to 1. So I go, okay, we're going to keep the principal values. We're going to do this principal value is going to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So when I make that restriction, again, going into the graphing portion, I look at my points on the original. This is y equals sine of x where I have restricted my domain to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and my range is negative 1 to 1. All right, then I come here, this point, which right now is I input an angle of negative pi over 2. I get out a ratio of negative 1. On the inverse, when I reflect it across y equals x, it becomes a ratio of negative 1 is mapped to an angle of negative pi over 2. Okay, this point is easy, 0, 0, you switch 0, 0, you get 0, 0. But what you have to remember here is that on this side, this 0 is an angle, and that 0 is a ratio, while over here, this is the ratio, and that is the angle. Okay, because we are switching inputs and outputs. And this point on the regular sine graph is going to be the uh, sine of pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. So the angle pi over 2 has a sine ratio of 1, becomes 1 pi over 2. <coughs> and again, we're going to be using the notation. I like to use the notation with the inverse sine of x. Uh, your book, and sometimes we'll ask it using this arc sine notation. But again, it's this idea that it is the angle whose sine ratio is x. This x is an angle. This y is a ratio. This x is a ratio. This y is an angle. And again, because we needed to make it a function, these are only going to be the principal angles, and it's only an angle from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So that's the first kind of sticking point with inverses, is you're going to have to remember which inverse function has which principal values that we are looking at. Okay. Again, when you're taking a look at this, when you are interpreting this, the sentence that you would say for this, if I say y equals inverse sine of x, what I am basically saying is y is an angle, And that angle is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 that has a sine ratio of x. And again, the same thing is, let's think about what quadrants we're talking about here. The quadrants that we're talking about, this is actually going to be quadrant 4 and quadrant 1. So it's a negative acute angle in quadrant 4 and then a positive acute angle in quadrant one when we're doing this one. All right, let's do a couple of examples of this to kind of show you what we're going to be looking for. So now I say evaluate. Uh, let's do inverse sine of, uh, let's do one. All right, so what you're going to basically do is when you see a problem like this, you're going to say, well, what are they actually asking me for? I'm going to remind myself that what is inside of here is a ratio. So this is actually asking me to find an angle from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 whose sine ratio is 1. And again, we're going to go back to our unit circle, and we're going to be thinking about all right, what angle has a sine ratio of 1. Now remember, the sine ratio is the y-coordinate. So now on our uh, unit circle here, um, let me fit two width again, 
I'm now going to kind of slide down. Actually, let me fit two heights. I need to see quadrants 1 and 4. So now I'm looking between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Here's negative pi over 2. Here's pi over 2. Now, it might be in your best interest on your unit circle when you are doing this is to recognize that even though 11 pi over 6 is in this location, I can't use 11 pi over 6 because it's not a negative acute angle. I have to convert this to negative pi over 6, negative pi over 4, negative pi over 3. Because these are the angles that I need. I need a negative acute angle that falls in this negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Not an angle that's coterminal to those. Think of it like a number line. I need the actual negative acute angle. All right, we're looking for an angle whose sine ratio is 1, which means the y coordinate. So I scan through my unit circle in this section, quadrants 4 and quadrants 1, and I see that I have a y coordinate of 1 up here at pi over 2. So in my problem that we're working down here, what I know on the unit circle is that the sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1, and I know that pi over 2 is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, so that's my principal answer, which is the one that they are looking for. Okay, you only give me one answer every time I ask you to evaluate this, and I need it to be the principal value. All right, let's do another one. Suppose I want to evaluate the inverse sine of negative square root of 3 over 2. Okay, again, the sentence, what am I actually asking you to do? I'm asking you to find an angle from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 whose sine ratio is negative square root of 3 over 2. Now as I'm thinking of this before I even go to the unit circle, because this is negative, I will remind myself that negative sine ratios, if my choices are quadrant 4 and quadrant 1, negative sine ratios are going to be in quadrant 4. So in my mind, I'm immediately going, I'm going to be in quadrant 4, and I need a negative acute angle in quadrant 4 that's going to have this sine ratio. We take a look at our unit circle down here in quadrant 4. I need a negative acute angle, so remember I'm going for this, that has a sine ratio, the y coordinate of negative square root of 3 over 2. So negative pi over 3 is the angle, the negative acute angle, that has a sine ratio of negative square root of 3 over 2. So in the problem that we're working, the angle whose sine ratio is negative square root of 3 over 2, since I know the sine of negative pi over 3 is negative square root of 3 over 2, and I know that negative pi over 3 is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, then I know that's the principal value that I'm looking for. And so my answer would be negative pi over 3. Now, a common mistake that I typically see on this is you're in your head, you'll be thinking that, hey, I know that the sine of 5 pi over 3 which is a quadrant 4 angle, is negative square root of 3 over 2. But the problem with giving me that as an answer to this problem is that 5 pi over 3 is not between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So that cannot be the answer to this inverse evaluation because the inverse always evaluates to the principal value. Just like when we are doing the square root of 9, the square root of 9 is 3, the positive value. So your inverse sign has to evaluate to the negative pi over 3. A right? couple of properties to pay attention to. Because this has switched the inputs, outputs of the cosine, remember that now your domain is the ratio and your range are the principal angles. So we want to make sure we kind of pay attention to that. And we know that the 
inverse cosine, this angle, T is an angle, has to always be an angle between zero and pi. And it only is true, this is only going to be a true statement, if the cosine of the angle equals the ratio, okay? So remember, because you're switching, this is the angle. It has to be a principal value. This is the ratio x right here. So you can kind of interchangeably work between these two as long as you recognize this angle has to be a principal value. And we can start doing things like the inverses where they undo each other, okay? The cosine of the angle whose cosine is x, what does this actually say? This is saying find the cosine ratio because the output of a regular cosine function is a ratio okay, of an angle whose cosine ratio is and this should make sense to you that I have a kind of restriction on this. Because x is a ratio, that ratio has to be a valid ratio. Valid ratios for cosine are only ratios between negative 1 and 1. So you want to pay attention to that. And then your inverse cosine, kind of switching the order here, will they undo each other in this direction? Only if the x that is there is an angle that is in the principal value range that we have been talking about. So it has to be a principal value because of our restrictions that we've had up here. Right? Now, where you want to be careful in something like this is suppose I was doing the cosine, uh, let's do the arc cosine of the cosine of, say, 5 pi over 3. If I was doing a problem like this, you want to kind of go inside and work your way out. So the first thing I would do is I would find the cosine of pi over 3. So if we go to our unit circle, I'll flip back to it real quick. On my unit circle, the cosine of 5 pi over 3 is the x-coordinate, so it's 1 half. Right? So we're basically going to be saying, hey, the cosine of 5 pi over 3 is 1 half. So in this example that I'm working on, this cosine of 5 pi over 3 is 1 half. So that turns my problem into the angle whose cosine ratio is 1 half. And here's where you have to be careful. As soon as I get to here, I go ding, 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 ding. This is evaluating an inverse cosine. So this has to equal an angle between what are the principal values for cosine? The principal values are 0 to pi, between 0 and pi. So I'm not going to give back 5 pi over 3 because 5 pi over 3 is not an angle between 0 and pi. The angle between 0 and pi that has a cosine ratio of 1 half is 2 pi, oops, sorry, not 2 pi over 3 because that would be negative. I would have to be in quadrant 1 because it's positive, so it would actually be pi over 3 is the answer. So that's where we start to see some of this composition coming in. Okay. And then again, your properties for your inverse sine. Again, your domain is now the ratios. Your range are now your principal angles. Your principal angles for your inverse sine are negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Again, our inverse sine of our ratio, remember this is a ratio, is going to be this angle T only if the angle is in the principal values. And if the angle's in the principal values, this also has to be true because of the switching inputs and outputs. And then same discussion we had up here. These compositions only return x provided you are in the correct domain and the correct range for these um, inverse functions. All right? And then this is just a comment about the graph. It has odd symmetry, which is not really too important for right now. So let's come over here and kind of do a quick evaluation of a few examples. I want to find the angle whose cosine is 1 half. That angle has to be an angle, sometimes I like to just write it right above, it has to be between the principal value for cosine 0 and pi, just to remind myself that. So the angle whose cosine ratio is 1 half, which we just did, is pi over 3. So you have to keep remembering what the principal values are. But when I come over here to do the arc sine or inverse sine, 
I have to remember that this has to be an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. The angle that has a sine ratio of square root of 2 over 2 is going to be pi over 4. Why are these the answers? This is because the cosine of pi over 3 equals 1 half and pi over 3 is in the interval 0 to pi. That is why that gets to be the answer. Over here, this is the answer because the sine of pi over 4 equals square root of 2 over 2 and pi over 4 is in the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay? So kind of going through, I'll just move through these fairly quickly and then let you kind of, you're going to be doing your own worksheets uh, to turn in for next class. The angle whose cosine ratio is negative square root of 2 over 2, oh, remember I'm between 0 and pi, which means I'm going to have to be in quadrant 2, so this would be 3 pi over 4. The angle whose sine is negative 1 half, now I'm between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and I'm, so I'm going to have to be a negative acute angle in quadrant 4. The angle whose sine is negative 1 half would be negative pi over 6. Okay, over here, doing the composition, when I do this composition, okay, I want to find the angle. Notice that I'm paying attention to what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an angle between 0 and pi that has a ratio, that has a cosine ratio of, now maybe I want to figure out what that cosine ratio is. What is the cosine of pi over 6? Square root of 3 over 2. So this is actually asking me for the angle between 0 and pi that has a cosine ratio of square root of 3 over 2. And so then I need to think about that. I knew I'm going to be in quadrant 1 because this is a positive ratio. And the angle that has a cosine ratio of square root of 3 over 2, oh, it happens to be pi over 6. Notice that I should have been able to go directly to the pi over 6 and cancel these out because this angle was a principal angle. And when it is a principal angle, the inverse cosine and cosine will cancel. All right, over here... I'm doing this problem, I cannot go directly to 11 pi over 6 because this is not a principal angle. So what I have to do first is kind of remind myself, this evaluates the cosine of 11 pi over 6, a, square root of 3 over 2, same ratio I had over here. But because this is not a principal angle, it's not going to be what my answer is. This answer has to be an angle between 0 and pi, whose cosine ratio is square root of 3 over 2. So I go, what is that? Oh, it's going to have to be pi over 6. So see the difference between these two when you take a look at it. All right, now another type of problem you'll get here is this g and h. Now notice that this is a ratio, but is a ratio that is not on the unit circle. And so I'm really kind of going, well, what am I going to do for this problem? What are they actually asking me for here? Let's translate this into a sentence. What they are asking me to do is to find the, and this is a regular trig function, so I want to find the cosine ratio, because the output of a regular trig function is a ratio. I want to find the cosine ratio of an angle whose, because this is an angle, whose cosine ratio is negative three fifths. I'm going to think to myself, do I really need to do any work for that? I have an angle that this angle right here is going to be an angle between zero and pi, right? And I go, and I'm an angle between 0 and pi that has a negative ratio. So I have to be in quadrant 2, right? So this angle, say we call it theta, has to be an angle that ends up in quadrant 2. It has a cosine ratio of negative 3 fifths. 
So I could have an adjacent side in my little reference triangle of negative 3. I could have a hypotenuse of 5. I could think of it in the terminal point definition and say I have an x coordinate of negative 3. And if we're smart and we know our Pythagorean triples, we know this y, this side over here is a 3, 4, 5. So the y coordinate of the terminal point would be 4. But it's, that's really not even necessary for the problem. What is the cosine of an angle whose cosine ratio is negative 3 fifths? They cancel each other out. It's negative 3 fifths. This was a valid, okay, valid ratio. Why was this a valid ratio? Because it was a ratio that was between negative 1 and 1. Okay. What if I had said instead of inverse cosine of negative 3 fifths, what if I had done the same problem and I said find the cosine of the arc cosine of negative 5 thirds. Now this, you really have to think your alarm bells need to go off. Because when I look at this negative 5 thirds, negative 5 thirds is not a valid ratio. Your negative 5 thirds is not between negative 1 and 1. Which means there is no angle that has that ratio. And if there's no angle that has that ratio, I can't take the cosine of it. So what would we say? We would say that this is undefined, or you could say that it does not exist. So that's going to be kind of the difference that we want to look at when we're doing these types of problems. All right? Now here, what about this? How do I do this problem? Let's talk about what it's asking me for. It's saying find the sine ratio right, because this is a regular trig function where the output is a ratio, find the sine ratio of an angle, right, inverse returns an angle, of an angle whose cosine ratio is negative 3 fifths. Notice that in this term, I don't even really need to know what the angle is, I can do it by looking at my picture that I have over here. I know that the cosine of theta, whatever angle it is, is negative 3 fifths. I know because of the angle has to be between 0 and pi, because that's the principal values, that this angle theta has to be in quadrant 2. And I can draw my triangle, just like we've done 100 times. We've done this problem before, we just didn't write it this way. And can I look at my triangle and figure out the sine? I can do it by looking at the triangle and do opposite over hypotenuse, okay, so I would have four fifths, or I can do it by looking at the terminal point and do the y, which is four, over the radius, which is five, y over r, four fifths, and so that's my answer. So that's kind of how we would look at problems that look like that. All right, now another thing that they're going to be making you do is say, hey, I want you to write these as algebraic expressions of x. So again, the idea here is if you translate what it's actually asking you to do, it should make sense. This is saying find the tangent ratio. And again, how do I know it's the tangent ratio? Because that's a regular trig function, no inverse, and it returns a ratio. So find the tangent ratio of, now I get in here, an angle. And again, between 0 and pi, because those are the principal values, because of the inverse, an angle between 0 and pi whose cosine ratio is x. So whatever you want to name this angle, maybe you want to name this angle theta. So what we know about this angle is that the cosine of theta is x, or we'll do it as x over 1, because that might help us. We've done problems like this. And what am I looking for? I am trying to find the tangent of that angle theta. So this problem we have actually seen before. If the cosine of the angle is x, first off, I've got to be in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. So let's kind of draw both triangles. If I'm in quadrant 1, okay, so if theta happens to be here in quadrant 1, the adjacent side is x, this is 1, I find the third side using Pythagorean theorem, which would be square root of 1 minus x 
squared. And we know, so it's all algebraic at this point. And I want to find the tangent of theta. And if you will recall, tangent of theta would be opposite over adjacent, which for this problem is going to be square root of 1 minus x squared over x. Now, would it change anything if I was in quadrant 2? Because I really don't know if this ratio is positive or negative. Let's draw the matching reference triangle in quadrant 2. The adjacent side, I can still use x because x is either going to be positive or negative and it'll take care of itself. This is still 1. This would still be square root of 1 minus x squared. It's still positive because it is the positive value coming up. And the opposite over the adjacent is still going to give me the same value. So the tangent of the angle whose cosine ratio is x is going to be square root of 1 minus x squared over x. All right, let's take a look at part B here. Now this one, you have to be very careful. This is using an identity. And what you have to recognize is that here's the angle that we're looking at. So what they're actually asking you to do here is to find the cosine of 2 times an angle. And then you got to go, wait a minute, that's an identity. Do we remember an identity? Our identity is we want to find the cosine of 2 theta. And since I have a sine here, I'm going to do it's 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. So this is the identity that I'm going to be keeping in mind. So I'm going to go, this is equal to 1 minus 2. And I'm going to write it as sine of theta squared, where theta is this angle whose sine is x. All right, so now in this problem, what we're going to do, let me do a quick little adjustment here, too, so I have a little bit more room. I'm going to select everything and shrink it down so I have more room over here on the side. All right, so what I need to do here is I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to draw the picture that goes with it. This is saying in the English little definition, my little sentence, I want to find the cosine ratio, and again, I know that's a cosine ratio because it's a regular cosine, of 2 theta, okay, given the angle, given theta is the angle, and this is inverse sine, so it's between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, given an angle between negative pi over and pi over 2 whose sine ratio is x. Now again, when I draw this one, I need to think, oh, I'm going to be in either quadrants 1 or 4 with this one. So I can draw my reference angle. Now again, I'm going to do this as x over 1. Now the opposite is 1, the hypotenuse. This would be square root of 1 minus x squared. When I draw in the triangle into quadrant 4, okay, this is the negative angle, this is still x, now it's negative, that's still 1, but notice this is still the same thing. So when I want to figure out this angle, theta, sine of theta equals x, well, if I know that, then I can do this, right? I don't even actually have to do any work. I can draw the picture, but I didn't need to do anything. I just want to find the cosine of 2 times theta, and I'm going to do this, and I said, oh, I actually didn't even need the picture. I can just do 1 minus 2, the sine of theta is x squared. So my answer is 1 minus 2x squared. So you will see a few problems where you're looking at the idea of writing the following as algebraic expressions of x. Okay? And the domain on which the equivalence is valid, well, that's because the tangent of the arc cosine of x, because this has a restriction of between 0 and pi, the domain on which it's a valid is 0 to pi. The domain on which this one is valid is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, now we're going to talk about the inverse tangent. Now, we do have the same idea, because remember, your tangent function has repeats out here. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to restrict our domain. We're going to make our principal values negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And we're going to recognize that, hey, that's very similar to the inverse sine. The only difference is, notice that it is now 
open parentheses because what's happening at the ends? Asymptotes, which really means there's no y values there. They're just the not included portion of the graph. And we do the same thing. We're going to do our switch. We're going to take our points. We have an angle of negative pi over 4 has a tangent ratio of negative 1. Is going to become a ratio of negative 1 has an angle of principal angle of negative pi over 4. Your 0, 0 becomes 0, 0. And your pi over 4, 1 becomes a ratio of 1 goes to pi over 4. And again, the idea here is if we were actually doing a few problems where we were evaluating these, you're going to remember your principal values are going to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. If I see a problem that says y equals arc tangent of x, what they are actually saying here is y is the angle, and that angle is going to be from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Um, whose tangent ratio is x. So that's kind of our interpretation. To do a couple of evaluations, if I want to do the inverse tangent of negative 1, okay, my sentence for this is going to be find the angle whose tangent ratio is 1, negative 1, and I'm going to remember that that angle has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Now at that point you have to kind of remember that your tangent, we're doing unit circle, we're looking for an angle, I can call it theta if I want, where the tangent of that angle, theta, is negative 1. And remember tangent on the unit circle is the y over the x. Now, of my choices here, again, remember, this is quadrant 4 and quadrant 1. First thing I notice is that I have a negative ratio, so I know I'm in quadrant 4. So I'm looking for a quadrant 4 angle, and it's going to be a negative acute angle that has a tangent ratio of negative 1. Now, I flip all the way back to where my unit circle was. Here I am. I am looking for something that has a tangent ratio of negative 1. And remember, it's y over x, and the only location where the y divided by the x is going to be negative 1 is where they are the same. So we're going to be looking at negative pi over 4. All right, so in the problem that we're working on, right here, let me go back to my best fit. But this problem then, since I know the tangent of negative pi over 4 equals negative 1, and I know that negative pi over 4 is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, I know it's a principal angle, and so that would be my answer. Right. Now, likewise, for the inverse cotangent, here's my cotangent graph. Again, I'm going to have to make a restriction. The principal values here again, we're going to make the principal values 0 to pi, because we're going to go in between our two asymptotes. So now notice this matches your principal values for your cosine. The difference is you're not including the 0 and the pi because they are asymptotes. You can think of it with your points being switched. An angle of pi over 4 has a cotangent ratio of 1. A cotangent ratio of 1 goes to a principal angle of pi over 4. A angle of pi over 2 has a cotangent ratio of 0. Then a ratio of 0 goes to the principal angle of pi over 2. And our angle 3 pi over 4 has a cotangent ratio of negative 1. And our negative 1 ratio goes to a principal angle of 3 pi over 4. So you get the same idea that we've had before, knowing what your graphs are going to look like. So a couple of the properties of your arc tangent and arc cotangent. And again, remember that we can write this as inverse tangent of x or arc tangent of x. And your inverse cotangent can be inverse cotangent of x or arc cotangent 
cotangent of x. The domain and the range, remember you're switching them from what they were back here. And remember that your range for the regular tangent function is negative infinity to infinity. Your domain, we did a restriction. It used to be everything except for negative pi over 2 plus pi k, but because we did that restriction to make it one to one, right, so it passes the horizontal line test, I only need to worry about the principal values. So these get switched. For your inverse cotangent, same thing. Your range is negative infinity to infinity, and we did our restriction on the domain, the principal values, 0 to pi. So in our little summary right here, we switched. Remember, these are now your ratios. These are your angles, your principal ones. We have some horizontal asymptotes, our end behavior. The left end of the arctangent graph goes to negative pi over 2. The right end is going to go to pi over 2. So we have a horizontal asymptote of y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2. And then these are some of the same properties before. I'll let you kind of read through those on your own. They're very similar to what we did. We'll do some examples. And your inverse cotangent. Here is your ratio. These are your principal angles. You do have your horizontal asymptotes. Your horizontal asymptotes are at 0 and pi because of your end behavior. And the same kind of reasoning that we had before. That as long as you are doing the composition for valid ratios, you can cancel these out. And as long as these are principal angles, you can cancel them out. If they're not principal angles, you got to do a little bit more work. All right, let's look at some examples of this. I want to find the angle whose tangent ratio is square root of 3. Now, I will remind myself, and this is why it kind of helps to just know these backwards and forwards. i got to look on the unit circle. i got to know where I'm going to have a tangent ratio square root of 3. If I can't remember which one it is, I can draw the triangle. I can think of this as square root of 3 over 1. This would be the opposite. This would be the adjacent. I'm drawing it in quadrant 1 because that's where the tangent restriction, remember this has to return an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And that angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 all right, well, it has an opposite side of square root of 3, an adjacent side of 1, a hypotenuse, using the Pythagorean theorem, of 1 squared plus square root of 3 squared, which is 3, square root of that, which is going to give me 2. 1 squared plus square root of 3 squared equals 4. So the square root of 4 gives me my radius of 2. And remember, that means that you have a terminal point of 1 square root of 3. 3, but on the unit circle, okay, your unit circle point is going to be, remember you have to divide out your radius, I want it to have 1, so I divide every side by, by 2, so I get 1 half square root of 3 over 2, and I think, where was that on the unit circle? Wasn't that the angle where we had the pi over 3 angle? Take a look at your unit circle. So the angle whose tangent ratio is square root of 3 is pi over 3. The angle whose cotangent ratio is negative square root of 3. All right? Got to do the same idea, but you got to be careful now. Cotangent is adjacent over opposite. And because it's a negative ratio, this one has to be an angle between 0 and pi. And because it's negative, I'm in quadrant 2. Quadrant 2. And I'm going to consider the ratio to be square root of 3 over 1. And so, and I need this to be adjacent over opposite. And in this quadrant, the adjacent's negative. So put the negative with the square root of 3. Your hypotenuse is still going to be 2. Same reasoning is over here. Your terminal point right here is going to be negative square root of 3, 1. 
and my terminal point on the unit circle is going to be negative square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. And then I go, all right, wait a minute, I'm in quadrant 2, which angle has that terminal point on the unit circle that's actually an angle of 5 pi over 6? So this would be 5 pi over 6. All right, everybody good? This will be kind of this idea of how we're working with this. Um, I'm going to do C and D. Let me actually uh, edit, duplicate this page. And then so that way I can clear the work that I have here. And we can now do the bottom two. This says find the cotangent ratio of an angle whose cotangent ratio is negative 5. Okay, is this a valid ratio for cotangent, which would be negative infinity to infinity? Yes. So, hey, valid ratio, they cancel each other out, negative 5, easy. Over here, this is saying find the sine ratio. I want to return the sine ratio of an angle whose tangent ratio is negative 3 fourths. So I'm basically looking at an angle, theta, that has a tangent ratio of negative 3 fourths, and then I go, wait a minute, this angle has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So when I go to draw the picture in order to do this problem, I have to be in quadrant 4, because that's a negative ratio. This is opposite over adjacent. And i got to think about which one should be the negative. The negative should be the opposite. The adjacent is 4. Hey, that would be 5. We did that nicely. And this is saying find the sine ratio. Well, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, negative 3 fifths. And there's your answer for that one. It's all about drawing the picture if it's something where you have different trig functions. If they are a function and it's inverse, just make sure it's valid and it'll cancel out. All right, I think that for basically what we're going to do, I'm going to stop there, and that should be a good start on your section 10.6. Uh, the only thing that I will kind of kind of mention about the inverse secant and the inverse cosecant, which are the only two I haven't done, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to notice that the inverse secant, I'm really, whenever I'm evaluating those, I'm actually not going to use the actual inverse secant and think of it that way. What I'm going to do for an inverse secant, so suppose I have the inverse secant of negative 2. When I do a problem like that, what you're going to remember is that this is the ratio. And this is saying find an angle. And the nice thing about this is this angle, notice I'm going to use this as my principal values. It's really 0 to pi minus the asymptote in the middle. Find an angle between 0 and pi, okay, I'm just going to write it like that, whose secant ratio is negative 2. Now, if I write that and I go, I don't really like secant, I want to change that. I want to go, well, what's the cosine ratio? If the secant of this angle is negative 2, the cosine of this angle is negative 1 half. I always convert to the cosine. And so then I ask myself, what angle on 0 to pi has a cosine ratio of negative 1 half? I know I'm going to be in quadrant 2, and it is going to be 2 pi over 3. So both for inverse secant and inverse cosecant, in order to do the problem, what you are going to do is you are going to convert it to the cosine of the sine. This is going to turn into the inverse cosine, the angle whose cosine ratio is negative one half. Notice what I flipped. I didn't do one over secant because the ratio is in here now. I do one over the ratio to get that. And that's how you're going to do that problem. I'll do one example here for your cosecant. Notice that we're basically doing negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 minus the 0 that's in there. So if I wanted to do the inverse cosecant of 2 over root 3, okay, 
the inverse cosecant of 2 over root 3. In my head, I'm going to go, this is the cosecant ratio. The cosecant of some angle is 2 over root 3. So the sine of some angle is square root of 3 over 2. I do that conversion. So I really change this to, I want to do the inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2. And then it goes back to find the angle between negative 5 over 2 and 5 over 2. That has a sine ratio of square root of 3 over 2, which is pi over 3. Okay? So I'm going to let you give that a try. We will discuss this when we come into class next time and, and play around a little bit more with these inverses. But that should be a good start for the section.